Ronnie, thank you. Uh, Mr. Johnson, very nice to have you here. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Ronnie, we're going to, uh, I'll tell the audience what we know, which is that we're going to visit for about 30 minutes uh, on the record and on camera. And then we're going to go off the record and off camera and then get into the good stuff <laughs> and spend about 15 minutes visiting uh, on a variety of topics that might be better left off camera and off the record and then spend about 15 minutes also off the record with all of you asking questions, joining the conversation. So think up some good ones as I'm Visiting with our guest, and Ronnie, I'll ask you to just give me a, a sense of when we're approaching 30 minutes. Uh, Mr. Johnson, before we get into, in a very broad sense, the intersection of business and politics, what one can learn from the other, I want to begin where we were visiting before this. Uh, you watched uh, Chairman Bernanke's press conference today, rare these days, maybe rare ever, for the uh, chairman of the Federal Reserve to have a press conference. Can you tell us what you saw and what you thought of it? Well, it's fascinating. Uh, it is actually the first time the chairman of the Federal Reserve has ever done a yeah. public news conference. Uh, he was on camera for an hour. Right. Uh, they said initially it would be 45 minutes, and I think you would have made a wager and I would have made a wager if you're trying to look as open as possible, you go over rather than short. No hard <laughs> No out. hard end. You yeah, keep right, answering yeah. questions as long as you can, as right. long as people want to ask them. Uh, it was a fascinating discussion of the economy and the economic outlook. Yeah. Uh, the Federal Reserve has been doing things that widely considered to be controversial uh, by many not doing enough on un unemployment, uh, by others not being careful enough about inflation, uh, the so-called QE2, the stimulus of buying additional treasuries uh, has been intended to be stimulative. It's not clear that it has been. He addressed all the different dimensions of the economic recovery, of the employment outlook. He gave their new forecast for the years ahead. Uh, and when it was all done, I was watching CNBC, and the four people they had on to do the evaluations of it all gave it straight A's on four measures. Uh, the Dow went up 105 points or something uh, in the hour or two after the, uh, I guess just a little, little over an hour Eastern time before the market closed. Right. Uh, so it seems to have been pro-momentum. Uh, it seems to have been a major step forward in terms of transparency for the Fed. Yep. Uh, and it seemed to be a major plus, personally, for Bernanke, who, as we could say, is not running for office. Right. But as chairman of the Fed, you are, in fact, like running for office almost every day, because public confidence is so vital but, to but what not, you do. But not exactly a celebrity. Alan Greenspan is George Clooney compared to Mr. Bernanke, <laughs> as, as, as far as that goes, right? He's not really been a very public figure. Sure it's OK with Clooney to say that? It might be, actually. Um, but, you, but you would grant that Mr. Bernanke has very, very little of the same public presence that Mr. Greenspan had for so many years. Oh, no question about that. Right. Uh, on the other hand, I find him dramatically easier to understand. Uh, I know Alan very well, Mr. Chairman Greenspan very well. I've been around Washington a long time. Right. And uh, I find him fascinating, and I think he's being blamed for a number of things he shouldn't be blamed for, yep. but generally a very high-quality chairman of the Fed. Uh, but to figure out how you chart his sentences and paragraphs tough. is really tough. Well, and the reality is that charting the, the, the Fed's sentences and paragraphs institutionally for the average person is difficult as well. And I wonder if what we're seeing today is an evolution of thinking about what the uh, intersection of the Fed and the public should be, or if this is a response to the negative press that the Fed has been getting. You know, we now are in a situation where Ron Paul's attacks on the Fed, which go back many, many years and were not taken seriously, are now actually being taken seriously to the point that there is real concern about what legislative action will happen uh, against the Fed. Maybe the Fed needs a PR effort, an active effort to regain some of its reputation out in the world. I don't think there's any question about that. Uh, it's important that there be confidence in the judgments of the Fed, yep. not go unchallenged or without skepticism, right. but there has to be confidence. Uh, Bernanke, I think, is an excellent spokesperson. Yep. I mean, he speaks so clearly. And you know, they got the first question was, uh, you've said today that interest rates are going to stay very low, Fed funds rates from zero to a quarter of a percent, and you've said to use the Fed language for an extended period of time. Uh, Chairman Bernanke, what exactly do you mean by extended? Yeah. To which he kind of didn't answer and kind of answered. Well, he, <laughs> but nevertheless, so he, he's officially a politician, right? Is that, <laughs> yeah, he's that's also officially based, linked 
tied to the data. Of course. And so if you say extended could be a year, it could be two years, and we don't know. Right. People, you know, t people take that specificity very seriously. They hold you to it if you oh, give, absolutely. And give particularly a the word answer. choice. Well, this is a good segue into this question of politics and governance and, 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 and corporate governance and what we should make of the two together and, se and separately. Because the, the Fed has not uh, held itself to the same standards of transparency and outbound communication that some in politics uh, hold themselves to. Certainly in elective office, they don't. Um, and in the corporate world, there's not as much of an, uh, of an eagerness to be as transparent and as outbound communicative as, as some in politics are. Let's start with that. Uh, uh, when you look at the corporate world today and the political world today, where do you see opportunities for one to learn from the other, where good can come from learning from one or the other? What a great question. Uh, I'm giving a presentation tomorrow in corporate governance. And this I'm is in Chancellor Cunningham's class. Exactly, in Chancellor Cunningham's class. And I'm going to start out with how things have changed in the last 10 years. And one of the things I was reviewing this afternoon as I was doing some preparation work is that if there is a single word that's probably been adjusted the most on corporate governance in the last 10 years, it's probably been transparency. Some of that comes from the Sarbanes-Oxley legislation. Right. Some of it comes from a broad corporate reform agenda that people are trying to change the way corporations are governed and the way boards of directors are chosen and how reports are made and who certifies the reports and what the access is to the proxy process and so right. on. A lot of change in the wind. Uh, on the other hand, if you look at all of the things that are going on, I would say that transparency has made a big leap forward in terms of corporate governance in the last, de last decade. Is, is the last decade as a marker coincidental? I go back 10 years, I think, what happened 10 years ago? Oh, Enron happened 10 years ago. <laughs> yeah. How much of that is the driver for the change? It's hard to say with all these things. It certainly is a factor. Yeah. Uh, We're still talking about the post-Enron world 10 years later, aren't we? Absolutely. And of course, yeah. we've had a lot of other things to talk about in the meantime. And if you right. look at Sarbanes-Oxley being signed into law in August of 2002, Sarbanes-Oxley legislation was largely written in the immediate backwash Aftermath, right, of yeah. Enron. Right. And so there's a lot in that piece of legislation. Corporate America, of course, loves to hate Sarbanes-Oxley. Right. Uh, on the other hand, with all those years I've served on New York Stock Exchange Company boards, a total of nine different uh, companies, I don't have any doubt that the companies I serve on today and the companies I used to serve on but are still doing well today are all better governed than they were 10 years ago. Compliance is better than non-compliance in well, the end. Compliance is complex under Cyberman's Oxford. Right. Undoubtedly, there have been a lot of expenses that particularly smaller businesses have suffered through and the so-called Section 404 and some of the other things that have been very controversial. Well, burdensome at a minimum. Burdensome, right? yeah. at least burdensome. Yeah. Uh, but nevertheless, if you say, okay, let's take the 10-year mark, let's take your point about Enron, let's look at Sarbanes-Oxley, right. I have no doubt that all of these companies are better governed today than they were 10 years ago. Is there something about the degree to which the media, broadly defined, have also evolved in those 10 years that makes transparency more of an issue? There are more people paying more attention to more things at more of a granular level with more devices and across more platforms. And so no pro probably the corporate world feels appropriately, correctly, under a microscope to a degree as never before. Well, the other thing is if, if you focus on the 2008 recession right. and the financial meltdown and all of the things that Treasury and the U.S. government did to respond, you know, there is also, with all these new media outlets and focuses and blogging and, and communication devices, there is also, as a result of that dynamic, an increased skepticism. Right. And that is, do we want to take this at face value? Is it something we can trust? What about dynamics of self-regulation? Uh, of course, on the other side, is the government overdoing it? Is, is it too intrusive? Is that because of access to more information just feeds people's natural skepticism and suspicion? Is that what it is? No, I think it's the size of the crisis. So, so if you that, go back to case, 2008 yeah. and you look at the right. size of the crisis, right. the implications for the taxpayers, you know, the exposure to $700 billion of bailout money and the right. stimulus. And I mean, if you look at all of the sort of major moving parts right. in U.S. economy and U.S. economic regulation, yeah. I think it was just at a scale that was unprecedented and impossible to ignore. Right. Also with employment going to, unemployment going to 10%, right. you know, it doesn't have to just be related to the medium. Right. It, it relates a lot, I think, to the severity of that crisis. Of course, you're on the board of one of those evil Wall Street 
firms that apparently have destroyed the world, you know. I don't actually call them evil. You don't? <laughs> well, I, I do think if they roll the tape back, you'll see that I called them evil, and I was actually parroting what they, what they say. But the point is, you, you've seen this from the inside. You're not just making a learned observation, uh, someone who's seen this stuff for so many years. You actually have seen as a board member the degree to which the world has changed over the last 10 years. Is it okay to plead guilty on camera? Or should you well, always... Well, it'd, make, should, it'd should, make news, I suspect. <laughs> so. I mean, talk, well, talk, I, talk well, about that. Well, let me that. just yeah. lay the facts on the table then. Yeah. I am the longest serving director at Goldman Sachs, and I'm chairman, if you promise not to laugh, of the Compensation Committee. So uh, I did go through this, you know, up front, yeah. uh, through the whole process. From Labor Day to Thanksgiving, in the fall of 2008, we had 22 board meetings. And that was when we moved from being a investment bank to a bank holding company. Right. All of our regulatory dynamics changed. We had $15 billion of treasury money invested in the firm. Uh, we were eager to pay that back as soon as we could, and we did as soon as we were allowed to. Right. Uh, but yes, I was uh, up front and close on the crisis. And as uh, Ronnie said in her remarks earlier, uh, I also served as a partner of Lehman Brothers. Right. So I've got double jeopardy. Sort of the one-two punch <laughs> yeah. of the last cycle. And yet, having served in politics, you also understand the political forces at work and that invariably you, not you personally, but you royally, institutionally, firms like Goldman Sachs and Lehman Brothers would be made a punching bag of by people in politics who are looking for someone or something to rail against. We have to blame somebody. That's America, right? And well, you guys end up being the ones to be blamed. Talk about... Uh, a clean hands problem. Uh, I also, of course, was at Fannie Mae for 10 years and CEO of that company right. for an extended period of time where there were a whole different group of people who were highly skeptical about who we were and what we did and why we were doing it. Next you're going to tell then us you own around the, again. Yeah. <laughs> Next you're going to tell us you own the New York Mets, basically. You're responsible for everything <laughs> bad that happened in the last 10 years. I, I never met Madoff. Never met Madoff. Okay, good. <laughs> um, but, but in all seriousness, what do you make of the political uh, uh, hand-wringing over this? Because the fact is, we have spent much of the last several years litigating and relitigating the question of whether Wall Street was collectively or individually firms responsible for the situation we find ourselves in. And you have a unique vantage point because you've been attached to people in politics for many, many years. You know people in power, still know people at the highest uh, reaches of power, and yet you also serve as a director on many of the uh, boards of many of the companies that are in the crosshairs. Well, it's often very frustrating. Uh, one of the things about Goldman Sachs that is particularly frustrating uh, is that we're in a thousand different lines of business in every country in the world that has you know, a substantial economy. Uh, what we do in the capital markets is unbelievably complex. Yeah. We have a very broad range of investments, and there's an overwhelming tendency uh, in politics to want to generalize in a way that makes you sound indictable across the board. Yeah. And so there are uh, very large numbers of things that we do that we think have enormous positive effect for the society, for right. the growth of the economy, access to venture capital, access to financing, lower costs of financing because of the capital markets efficiency. You know, there are a whole lot of dynamics which we have absolutely no question we are making an enormous positive contribution. Yeah. You, know, you then get into some of the dynamics of the mortgage market, which I know well from my other experience, and you look at what happened and how it happened and who's responsible and so on, and I don't think anybody comes out of that with clean hands. Right. I mean, there was the regulators have a lot to answer for. Not on for. the corporate side, not on the political side, not no, on the regulator nowhere. side, nobody. <laughs> nowhere. Right. And so to sort all that out is extremely complex, and the essence of politics, particularly in a fast-moving media 24-hour right. news cycle, is to utter something that can be captured in a sentence or two uh, that is the ultimate summary of a very complex case. Mm -hmm. And so I find it enormously frustrating you know, to listen to long hearings and listen to long lists of accusations. And you can't say innocent across the board, yeah. but to say guilty across the board is a leap which is way beyond the merits of the case. Let's use this platform here at least to correct one misperception. You picked the one misperception about the ways in which the Wall Street banks, the Wall Street firms were unfairly uh, thrown to the lions in the last couple of years. Pick one and you disabuse us of what we think we know. I think that the most important thing about the whole mortgage crisis is that all of the people who should have been responsible for standard, standard setting in the quality of underwriting, the quality of mortgages, 
were either asleep at the wheel or knowingly complicit in generating tens of billions of dollars of super poor product, so-called subprime. Right. And in the old days, before the uh, capital markets executions became so sophisticated, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac basically played that role. Yeah. When I first went to Fannie Mae in 1990, you know, we essentially set the underwriting criteria for mortgages. As more and more ways of originating mortgages and financing mortgages developed, none of the regulators were on top of it, and there were a lot of people touching pieces of the process who were only aware of the part of the process they touched. There was nobody doing a systemic look, and that's, of course, part of what came out of Dodd-Frank, yep. was a systemic orientation. Uh, and all of a sudden, we were doing hundreds of billions of dollars of product with the rating agencies in the middle of it in a way that was not constructive. And all of a sudden, we have a gigantic crisis because nobody really had the qualitative assignment in making sure, or, or people who had it didn't fulfill it. Right. And so it's a very serious matter. Who specifically is responsible for that oversight or that lacking? Well, in many cases, the players who were doing the origination, where there was a lot of fraud, yeah. uh, where there was a lot of uh, no documentation, whatever, right. were not regulated by anybody. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was nobody, no assigned regulator to a... So it's not even as if you could blame somebody in government who was responsible for this because nobody was responsible. Nobody was responsible for lots of the different pieces of this. Yeah, and is I that mean, a problem that goes back not just through this administration but past administrations? Oh, yeah, it, it goes, it's a problem this that goes all back developed since the 30s and right. with the creation of the FHA and the creation of Fannie Mae. Indeed. And over a long period of time, then in the early 70s, the creation of Freddie Mac and the right. Federal Home Loan Bank System and all of these things together. You know, there were, in each of those institutions, qualitative control dynamics, right. but as it then just spun and grew and got bigger and bigger and bigger, uh, there were important pieces of this that nobody basically had any oversight for, yeah. including the creation of a lot of the mortgage-backed securities and collateralized debt obligations and, and all of these things where the rating agencies were, say, AAA, yeah. and there was no, really no review process. Did the, the last on this before we get back to politics and, 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 and corporate similarities and differences, did the Wall Street banks, did Goldman and the other firms who were uh, in the crosshairs, as I said, uh, do a sufficient job of pushing back at, publicly? Do you think they, that, as, a, as communication goes, did they do a good job of communicating their side of this and, and fight for their side of this over the course of these years? Well, that's a tough one. Uh, because I, mean, we're just, I was just working on an issue this morning, uh, which you'll see in the papers in the next few days, uh, involving Goldman Sachs. You don't want to tell us? Oh, yes. I'd, I'd love to. It's totally confidential. I'd be right. pleased just, to just disclose am, it just, here. For just among the 80 of us <laughs> in here. Should we I look into the camera? <laughs> look directly into the camera. Right. So we'll read about this thing. We'll know anyway, at the time that it was the thing yeah, you were talking I mean, about. This happens every day for every company. Right. Where you've got something you're worried about that somebody is looking into or somebody is criticizing you for, yeah. and you don't know whether to get out ahead of it, because if you do, you're, you guarantee it's gonna be a big story. Right. You don't know whether you can take a one-day bad story, yeah. because you don't know whether it's a one-day story or not before you get the one-day story. Right. And so you're constantly trying to calibrate whether or not you should stay silent or you should engage. And not every story can come out on Friday afternoon at 5 o'clock. Exactly. Right. And particularly now with the 24-hour news cycle, yeah. Fridays aren't as good as they used to not be. Not in the world that we're <laughs> in, right. Well, let, let's come back to this question of politics and, and, and the corporate world. As you think about your life, one foot in one, one foot in the other, sometimes two feet in one and no feet in the other, which has been more fun for you? Uh, if you had to choose, would you prefer to be all corporate, no politics? Could you possibly imagine a time in which you're not one foot in one, one foot in the other? What a, another great question. The, uh, yeah, I went back and forth from the time I was, I used to teach at Princeton. Right. And I went into uh, taking a full-time political job after that, working in the campaign of uh, President Muskie. You probably don't remember his presidency. No, I don't. And I remember I, his tears, but I don't remember his presidency. And I worked for President McGovern right after that. Right. I, rem I remember his one state. <laughs> I remember that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Don't, don't forget the District of Columbia. Well, it's just not a state, actually, right? <laughs> so you, you have so, a good record for so, picking them, don't you, actually? Right. Right. Oh, yeah. absolutely. That's yeah. why I worked so, for so many. Right. Because uh, they always lose. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, but in any case, uh, you know, I went through my 20s as a combination of academic and full-time political. Right. Uh, I decided when I was 29 or 30 or whatever, I wanted to get a business experience. So I actually went to work back then for Target, Right. which is how I first got to know the whole uh, Target uh, organization. Long before you became a board member. Oh, yeah. Obviously. Decades. Decades before. And, uh, and then I, 
Then Walter Mondale asked me to come to the convention with him in 76. He was named to the ticket with Carter, and I then for uh, four and a half years. Did you know Mondale, by the way, through Minnesota? Is that yeah, what it was? Through, actually, the, through the, the, the target relationship, that then became a Well, Mondale. we don't need to make this overly personal, but he was an intern in my father's office when he was Speaker of the House of the Minnesota Legislature. Ooh. Back in the 50s. Well, make, make it that personal. That's, <laughs> right. I, that, yeah. that's something I didn't know. Just yeah, so something I, there. That's so I've known, that known it for a long time. Yeah. And, uh, and for the four and a half years, I was generally sitting about as close to him as, as I am we, to you now. Right now. And so I did full-time government right. and politics then for that period. Right. And uh, I hope we, do we have time for a, a story that's more than a few sentences. Uh, Bruce Dayton, who was then CEO of Dayton Hudson, which owned Target, and which right. is the equivalent of the modern Target. Uh, kin, kin clearly to the governor of Minnesota, current governor, Mark Father. Dayton. Father of Mark Dayton, Father current, of the current governor, governor of Minnesota. And so Bruce Dayton called me after we lost the 1980 election to Ronald Reagan. And he said, uh, he said what are your plans? And I said, uh, I said, well, Mr. Mondale has asked me if I'll stay with him, stay close, uh, figure out how we do that exactly, but stay close. Uh, and be in charge of his presidential run for 1984. Knowing surely that he would run four years yeah. hence. And so uh, Mr. Dayton said to me, uh, what are the chances that if Vice President Mondale runs, he wasn't very political, uh, he said, what are the chances that he'll get the nomination? And I said, oh, maybe one in three. Kennedy was still in it at that yeah. time. It was very, you know, it wasn't a clear choice. I said, maybe one in three. Gary so. Hart, not on your radar screen yeah, yet. Yeah, not right? yet. John yeah. Glenn, bigger than he turned out to be. Yeah. And, uh, and then he said, well, if Mondale gets the nomination, uh, what are the chances he'll be elected against Ronald Reagan? I said, well, at this stage, it's always 50-50. I mean, Reagan hadn't even been inaugurated yet. Right. So, so it's 50-50. And honestly, the, the 80 election was, was a close election. Yeah, absolutely. And so yeah. he, so Mr. Dayton then said, Jim, he said, so your personal career strategy has a five out of six chance of you having yourself out on the street after the 84 election with no career, right? I said, well, that's, that wasn't the way I was thinking Probably about it, Mr. It. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't exactly thinking about it that way. Right. But I think the arithmetic is right. <laughs> and uh, so he said, well, I'd suggest you think about something, something, else. something else. And that's actually when I created public strategies. Mm -hmm. and that was your something else. That was my something else. I got a fellow named Richard Holbrook, right. who died recently, to be my partner. Yep. We got a third partner. And we created this firm, which ultimately Jack Martin uh, bought from me for one dollar. Is that right? Yeah. He got a good deal. He got a very good deal. He didn't just sell it to Hill and Knowlton for one dollar, did he? No. No. <laughs> a little bit, little bit more than a dollar. A little bit more. Uh, so, so, so the politics part was fun. It wasn't that you left it. Great it fun. left you. You enjoyed it. It just happened that you gravitated naturally out of politics and into the corporate world as more of your full time. Absolutely, but I I love the business side, you know, the business calculation of what the strategy is and where the profits are, right. and how you fulfill social responsibility as well as your profit obligations and right. obligations to your shareholders. So you some know, of the public service stuff that you enjoyed uh, helping to orchestrate and execute on in politics has come over with you to the corporate world absolutely. and become a big focus of what you did. And Fannie Mae was the ultimate hybrid, which was why, why so many people hated it. Right. You know, lots of people wanted to have housing only, forget about profits and shareholders, and other people wanted to, no distortions in the private markets and right. no special advantages, don't like the mortgage interest deduction. Yeah. So we were right in the middle of navigating right. through what is a combination, a yeah. truly unique combination, and now obviously not successful combination as it went through the 2008 crisis. Right. Uh, but when I was there in the 90s, uh, we had a capacity to have enormous shareholder value Growth in, enormous growth in shareholder value. When I came, the market cap of Fannie Mae was $8 billion. Uh, when I left, it was $80 billion. Uh, and at the same time, we financed you know, 17 million homes while I was chairman. Yeah. And, uh, and we did it in a way with almost no defaults. Now, we had a good economic environment, but almost no defaults and uh, a very good overall performance in terms of new immigrants and minorities and people below the median income and I mean we were really extending the value of home ownership broadly and responsibly. Mm -hmm. People now argue well you can't really go there responsibly yeah. you know stay in only with the 30 percent down and really safe and people who've saved up you know tens of thousands of dollars. It is possible to extend home ownership to people who can afford it in a way that they can sustain it. And yet the perception Mr. Johnson of, of Fannie Mae is much like the perception of Goldman Sachs. 
your view of it is as misunderstood and misperceived, and it's become a punching bag, as you well know, Fannie Mae has, over the last couple of years. Yeah, and I, that's why I say virtually not a word. Yeah. The main thing I say about Fannie Mae is when I left 12 years ago, it was a dream. Yep. That's about it. And you have no, you have, <laughs> I'm not taking you have no, on the current. No point of view or no observation that you want to offer about the last 12 years, even among the 80 of us, you're sure, actually. That could be in the off-the-record part, actually. Yeah. Um, uh, what do you think has happened to the Democratic Party, to your party? You, you, you left working for Mr. Mondale as his executive assistant in January of 81. So we're now 30 years out. You have witnessed the ebb and flow of the Democratic Party. You witnessed the Reagan era and the first Bush presidency. You then watched President Clinton on behalf of the Democrats regain the White House. You then saw President Bush snatch defeat from, or victory from the jaws of defeat with Vice President Gore. I guess some people would yeah, even challenge that, that, right? Yeah, this whole selected, not elected thing continues <laughs> not to go away. Um, then we now have the, uh, the return of the Democratic Party to the White House under President Obama, but it's been to the, in the minds of not just a lot of Republicans, but a lot of Democrats, a mixed bag these last couple of years. So wh what do you make of the evolution of, these thir of politics over these 30 years with a particular eye to your Democratic Party? Well, there's a lot to say. Uh, I was an early supporter of Barack Obama, and I think the formulation of what needed to be changed and modernized about our perspective of where, what America could do and where we could go was spectacular as he went through 2008 and through that campaign the period. The pitch was a good pitch. The pitch was fabulous pitch. Right. And I think uh, it engaged lots of people, lots of independents, lots of Republicans, lots of people who were not previously voting in a way that illustrated that there are avenues to connecting with the American people, you know, which are very powerful. Uh, I think if you look at all the survey research now about where does the president stand, uh, you know, he has moderate levels of approval, moderate to poor levels of approval. Uh, not in an unprecedented way for a president not in, an unprecedented end, you know, way. in the middle of his first term. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I think stunningly challenging issues. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you look at the combination of all that's going on in the Middle East. Three wars now. Right? Three wars. If you look at the 2008 uh, recession and financial crisis, uh, if you look at the monumental effort to get the health care legislation and the controversy that generated and the ability of the Republican Party in many cases to fix the perceptions around what that health care plan was and what its weaknesses were right. early on through that debate, uh, you know, it's been an extremely challenging time. Now, the way I like to think about it, because I'm a Democrat, is that I think the chances of Barack Obama being reelected are about three out of four. Now, you can say, is that purely because of the strength and insight and, and skill of the Democratic Party? Or could you say that maybe there's something to do with who the Republicans might be? I choose the latter as the way of explaining the 75%. Right. Uh, but I think, uh, I think President Obama has been very skillful in many respects. And I think as he comes now to present his case for reelection, I think he's going to do very well. I think he's going to win. You know, so it, the, the party has evolved. And one of the things that's crystal clear is that the old base of the Democratic Party is not a majority base. Yeah. And so therefore, it has to be expanded in a variety of different ways. In the last election, the entire margin that went to Barack Obama was 18 to 29-year-olds, first-time voters, and minorities. That was produced a seven-point victory. But that was a stunning level of turnout yep. uh, among people who were not traditionally in the calculation. Yep. And so if you look at maybe not being able to get as much turnout there, if you look at skepticism now among independents, skepticism among independents is pretty high. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a job to do. But I think the Republican Party at the moment is failing to find a compelling narrative. And they're clearly failing to find a consensus candidate. Right. And that's obviously a huge factor. And so that in that respect, if we believe that uh, 1994 was the precursor to 2010, possibly 1996 is the precursor to 2012. Well put. Yeah. We have time. Can I ask him one more thing before we go to the next portion of this? So I want to come back to the, uh, you, I thought, did a, a, a succinct job of characterizing the Obama uh, first term uh, thus far. But I want you to put your corporate hat on in analyzing what you articulated as his challenges. Uh, uh, the president, for all his... Uh, skills, famous skills as a communicator on the campaign trail, and you alluded to how well he articulated the pitch during the campaign. 
Hasn't he done a lousy job of selling his own accomplishments over the last two years? I mean, the man has done an extraordinary amount, whether you like it or not. He's achieved an enormous amount over the last two years, but the problem is the White House has not done much of a job of selling it up to this point. Would you agree with that? No, I think it's a radically different challenge. Uh, when you, and I've done a lot of campaigns, and I've been involved with a lot of people making the pitch. Right. Uh, making the pitch as a candidate is so dramatically different than explaining the progress of legislation and the integration of policy in the context of the Washington meat grinder in policy making. And so to get a clean perspective on that uh, is extremely difficult. But you have to do it. In theory, every president, whether he's running for re-election or not, has to say, we said we were going to do this. Here's what we've done. Some of it we could get done. Some of it we couldn't. Here's why. You've got to report in, don't you, to your to the people who hired you, here's the job I've done. No question you have to do it, but you don't have to win every day. Right. You have to have the building blocks in place. Yeah. You have to have the core narrative in place. You have to have the contrast in place. And when you have ultimately the contrast, that's what defines whether it's 96 or it's another year. So you're satisfied? My guess is that it's very likely to be 96. Right. You're satisfied that he's communicated sufficiently in the context of the job he has to do? I think it's unbelievably complex. It's unbelievably complex. One, one more corporate thing before we open it up for the off-the-record portion, and that is just, again, wearing your corporate hat. One of the jobs of the commander-in-chief, the chief executive, is to set priorities. Mm -hmm. A lot of people have now, looking backwards, where hindsight is always 2020, has said that setting priorities was a, a problem for this president. He chose to go for health care, which was enormously difficult, as opposed to tackling the economy and specifically jobs first. Did he make a mistake in doing that? There is no question in my mind whatsoever it was a big mistake to let the perception develop that there was a way of focusing every day on the economy that would have substantially improved economic progress. Right. I think to some degree the reason health care was chosen was that time was needed to heal yep. on a lot of the economic issues and the natural forces of rebuilding momentum and recovery. So on, virtually all of the recoveries in the post-war period have been much sharper, higher, higher velocity recoveries than we had coming out of 2008. So the calculation that a lot of this will move through good economic policy, but we can't figure out something new to say every day, I think led to the focus on health care. I think in retrospect, if you said what was the fundamental mistake of the first two years, I think I'd go to the perception side rather than the policy side, which is always kind of a cop-out. Yeah. But I think that the cop-out on perception uh, is that he, he didn't really have a way of doing the economy every day. And the fact that he let the perception develop that he wasn't doing the economy every day was a huge mistake. All right. Well, I think we've concluded the public portion of our program today. Let's give Jim Johnson a hand. and. Thank you for being here.